Welcome, everyone. Hi, I'm Jaron Springer, CEO here at Greater Nashville Realtors. Welcome to our Nationomics Now. Uh, this is a virtual quarterly series to provide content on hot topics throughout the year on the economic outlook of the real estate industry on a local state as well as a national level. So before we get started, though, I do want to make you aware uh, that our in-person Nationomics event is scheduled for the morning of Thursday, May 18th. It's going to be at a new location this year. So everybody uh, hear me when I say it's going to be at Trevecca University in the Boone Convocation Center this year. So that's a new location, not at the Music City Center, but at Trevecca University. It's going to be an outstanding location for us where we we're going to have free parking, a lot of space, and it's a it's a really good spot for us. Speakers at the Nationomics now on May 8 or the Nationomics event on May 18th will include uh, a realtor panel discussing the market. Uh, NAR Chief Economist Lawrence Yoon, as well as Jeff Height, National Area Chamber of Commerce's Chief Economic Development Officer. So save that date. Registration will be opening in the coming months. But today for Nationomics Now, we have Deputy Chief Economist and Vice President of Research, Jessica Louts, as our guest. Jessica is going to present on the top nine trends to watch in real estate. So please note, that there's going to be a recording of this session on Facebook, and it'll also be posted onto our website as well uh, soon after the event ends. So please share that content with your fellow realtors and with clients. So with that, I'd like to introduce Greater Nashville Realtors Board of Directors, President-elect Kevin Wilson, who's going to serve as our moderator and host today. So welcome, Kevin. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks for doing this. Good morning, Jaron. Thanks so much. And uh, I get the uh, distinct honor of introducing our guest speaker today. Uh, as Jaron said, Dr. Jessica Louts is Deputy Chief Economist and Vice President of Research at the National Association of Realtors. The core of her research focuses on analyzing trends for both NAR members and housing consumers. Through the management of surveys, focus groups, and data analysis, she presents new and innovative ways to showcase results. She effectively utilizes research data to educate and impact policymakers on the state of the housing market and discusses research findings in major media outlets and international presentations. In 2021, Dr. Louts was named one of Housing Wire's Women of Influence, a list representing 100 of the most influential women in leadership in the housing industry. In 2022 and 2023, Dr. Laus was named a RIS Media Newsmaker in the Influencer and the Crusader categories. She also volunteers at Nottingham Trent University as an industry fellow mentoring real estate graduate students. Jessica received her Doctorate of Real Estate from Nottingham Trent University in the United Kingdom. She also holds a master's in public policy from American University and undergraduate degrees in political science and law and justice from Central Washington University. Thank you so much, Dr. Laos, for being with us today. I will turn the webinar over to you. Thank you so much, Kevin and Jaron, for having me. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to join you all virtually uh, in the Nashville area, one of my favorite cities, honestly, in the US. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, hopefully you all can see my PowerPoint and I'm gonna jump through and talk about a lot of things that we're seeing right now in the real estate market. Um, yesterday, if you follow the news, we released our national existing home sales data and we saw, unfortunately, that we now have a solid year of really a contraction in real estate sales activity. Uh, we know that interest rates have gone up. Uh, they seem to have gone slightly back down. Now at 6.3%, it's really priced out a lot of potential consumers out of the market. And those that it haven't, hasn't priced out are, are those homeowners who are sitting on a lot of wealth, a lot of housing wealth, seeing their home uh, really appreciate and value. Uh, they have quite a bit of equity if they wanted to make that move. But a lot of them essentially have golden handcuffs. They don't want to make that move right now because they have a low interest rate themselves. So perhaps revitalizing their home, remodeling their home, uh, reusing their home in a different way may happen in their future, uh, but not necessarily that move. And that's crunching inventory even more. Uh, still seeing uh, slight gains in home prices, uh, 
seeing that more so in some areas of the country where inventory is still tight and migration flow is still happening. So let's jump in. I'm going to show you some of the data on basically every one of those points and a bunch of others. So uh, jumping in here, I, I think the big thing that I want you to all take away from this section is we really have to go beyond the headlines because if we're only looking at the headline data, when we're looking at real estate, uh, we really do hear a different message than what's happening in local markets. Uh, and when I look at your local market, I can see the inventory still pretty pretty down. We know that days on market have gone up. Now they're closer to 60 days on market. And this is based off of your data that I, I grabbed from the National Association. Uh, median price, well over the national median price. So while it is more affordable than many areas of the country, say New York City, where I know there's been a lot of migration flow into uh, from New York City into Nashville, uh, unfortunately, that's pushed up your local home prices. Uh, and so it's, it's becoming a very unaffordable location for many people who have lived there and not migrated in. Unfortunately, uh, seeing that home sales activity is still down in your local area as well, and, and I would say that that's largely due to and influenced by that rising interest rate and really pricing a lot of consumers out of the market. Uh, so when we look at this, you know, I, I want to draw some comparisons here, and this is backing it out back onto a national scale, I would say the vast majority of my slides, except for about one other, are going to be talking about the national data here. But I, I suspect that a lot of these trends can be uh, reflected on in your local market here as well. When we look at the number of offers that is being received uh, for every home that's on the market, if we think about spring of last year and just the the highly hot market. Uh, I cannot stress enough how hot that market is. And, and one of the indicators of that is to really see the number of offers for every home that was listed. Consumers were smart. It was talked about a lot in the media. It was talked about a lot by professionals in the real estate industry that interest rates were going to rise. And consumers understood that and they jumped into the market and they said, okay, I was waiting. I, this is the time I have to make this move if I want to take advantage of this interest rate at 3% here before it jumps. And so we saw that there were 5.5 offers for every home that was listed. Now we're seeing it back down to about 2.5. Uh, now it had gone down even lower last month and, and we're starting to see slight climbs. I think this could be an early indication of the spring market. Uh, yesterday, uh, the news of existing home sales, really seeing that the drop that we saw in existing home sales on a year-over-year -year basis was actually one of the smaller amounts that we had seen. So perhaps we have hit the bottom now and the spring market will actually uh, bring out some buyers who are, who are ready to make that move now. One of the good indicators in the market too is understanding the investor market and the mom and pop investors who have jumped into the market over the last couple of years. If we look at January of last year, so a little over a year ago, 13 months ago, what we can see is that high water mark of 22% of everyone in the market was an investor or a vacation buyer. Now, I would say that there's probably a lot of crossover in that now. There's not a clear definition, especially with Airbnb and VRBO. If you can rent that property for a couple of weeks or yeah. you're staying in it for a couple of weeks and you're renting it for the rest of the year, what are you? Are you an investor or a vacation owner? And there's no clear definition at this point. What we do know is that in January of 2022, we had the lowest inventory we actually had ever recorded at NAR. And that was a headline figure for a lot of newspapers and publications out there. They said, wait a second, <laughs> this is the lowest inventory. And when you have the lowest inventory of anything, there's going to be investors coming into the market. And so we certainly saw them come in, whether it was to hold on to that property or to flip that property. Right now we see it at 16% of the market. So back towards the norm, if we look at this, there's a lot of volatility on a monthly basis in this data. But you can see that's back towards the norm. And that's certainly a good thing when you think about the limited inventory that we have is probably being snagged up by primary residence buyers uh, rather than investors. All of that said, even though we're not seeing this huge investor share in the market, what we are seeing is a lot of all cash buyers. So people who may be moving longer distances, who have a lot of housing equity, who can actually pay all cash. And that could be a primary residence buyer, that could be an investor who's doing that as well. 
But right now we see 29% of the market are all cash buyers. That's the highest we've recorded since July of 2014, uh, matching that July of 2014 number. If we back that out a little further, what we can see is that high water mark of 35%. So I think that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, one of the reasons why I think that is that we saw there was a lot of all cash buyers in the market last spring. Now, those buyers were saying, I have to offer all cash. If I want to have my offer accepted, I have to make it an incredibly competitive offer and not having uh, an offer that is due to financing uh, or needs to rely on financing certainly makes that offer competitive. But right now we're seeing all cash buyers in the market, perhaps because of this rise in interest rates, people are saying, well, I don't have to take on a loan. I actually can uh, move into this new home because of this housing equity that I may be sitting on and actually make this purchase uh, with all cash. And I think this is a really interesting phenomenon that we're seeing in the marketplace right now. I'd be very interested to see what happens in the months moving forward when we look at a spring market where perhaps we're going to see more primary residence buyers and fewer investors. I'd be very curious to see what happens at that point. The other uh, figure that I think is really important to take note of right now is distressed sales. Um, we are hearing, at least I'm hearing, and I'm certainly seeing on social media, a lot of misinformation about this right now. Uh, whether it's you know scrolling through my phone and seeing an Instagram reel or a TikTok video, uh, recycled content there, uh, whatever it is, I'm hearing, well, home prices are gonna drop and we're gonna have all these distressed sales coming onto the market. We're just not seeing it. And the reason why is because of that housing equity, because of that consistent rise in home prices. So if we look at this back to 2009, we really were in a crisis at that point. And half of realtors were working with a client who had a distressed sale. They did not have enough equity in their home and they had to have a foreclosure or a short sale, unfortunately. Right now, what we see is just 1% of realtors working with distressed clients. And so I think this really does speak to the housing equity that people have. And even if something did traumatic happen in, in that household, uh, such as a job loss or an unexpected death, we know that that consumer is likely able to sell their home, has housing equity, and can move into either a smaller property, a more affordable property, or temporarily move in with family. And that's certainly a good news when we think about that overall as well. We really are in a different paradigm than where we were six months ago, a year ago, uh, but we're in a new paradigm overall. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is really helpful when we talk about right now and the contraction and activity is just how different it is from 2008 and 2009. And I guess a few ways to really convey how different that is, is the first is tight lending. We have incredibly tight lending standards right now. It's very difficult to obtain a mortgage. You have to have solid credit. You have to have money in reserves. You have to be able to uh, secure that loan and say, I can pay this back and here's my income. Uh, we do not see subprime lending in the market right now. The other reason is that we have very low housing inventory. And I know Nashville, uh, you really feel that quite acutely because you have had a migration flow into your city. And this was happening well before the pandemic. And then it continued and accelerated during the pandemic. But overall, if we look at this in the US, we're short by six and a half million units of uh, homes where people could live and they could move into as we see millennials aging in to peak household formation at the same time that aging adults are really staying put. And that's really my third one here is that the demographic situation that we're in right now is quite unique. We do have this wave of young adults who are moving into their first home, and we see a lot of older adults just staying put and being healthier later in life in their bonus years and saying, I'm going to stay here. I'm okay. I don't need to downsize or I don't need to move into a nursing home. I'm perfectly healthy and there's no need for me to do that. And I'll show you some data on, on both of those points as well. Oops. Okay, so looking at the existing home sales data, if we look at this and the forecast moving forward, um, I think what's really important here is all the blue and the green has already happened, but pulling out the green here, these are the unusual years of 2020 and 2021 when the pandemic really fueled a lot of activity in the housing market because people could work remotely, because they could work in hybrid settings and they didn't have to go into the office. And suddenly they found themselves in need of a bigger space. They also saw that interest rates were low and so they could afford more home than they would have been able to just a couple of years ago when they think about those higher interest rates. 
So a lot of people jumped into the market. The third factor at play, of course, is that people needed their support systems. They needed to be close to friends and family. And so a lot of people moved pretty long distances, in fact, to be close to their friends and family and have that support system around there. Regardless of the reason, and it may not just be one reason, they jumped into the housing market, really fueled all of that home sales activity, that unusual home sales activity over the last couple of years. If we look at 2020, the first half of the year, the first quarter, especially incredibly hot market. Then we look at the second half of the year, it's it's really um, looking at two completely different markets. And we can see that the market cooled immediately when interest rates rose and has continued to. Looking into 2023, uh, new forecast uh, will be coming out hopefully soon, uh, but this is based on December's forecast from Dr. Lawrence Hewn, our chief economist, uh, and I'll give you the numbers here just so you can see them as well. I think it's quite helpful to take a look. So when we're looking at the forecast uh, moving into 2023, he does expect that home sales will continue to be down. And really it's because we're comparing that activity uh, to really that, that incredibly hot, unusual market at the first half of the year. And, and because of that, home sales would be down in 2023 and they, they continue to be right now. Home prices, he has those as flat. Half of markets will continue to see home price gains because of the lack of inventory, because of migration flow, especially in the Sun Belt states. Half of markets, unfortunately, were already seeing declines in home prices. Moving to 2024, much more promising, seeing home sales increase, home prices increase as well at 5%. Uh, so back in line, actually, with what would be normal home price appreciation as opposed to those double digits that many areas saw. All right. So one of the things that I, I've already touched on here, but I think it's just so important. And let's take a look at the data because I, I do think it's pretty fascinating if we take a look at this. Uh, one of our economists, Nadia did, Nadia Evangelo did an amazing analysis here. She actually took USPS data, change of address data. So the one caveat I'm going to say about this is that this includes both renters and home buyers because it is change of address data. But she actually did a Freedom of Information Act to get this data, uh, which is pretty incredible in its face. In looking at this, this is essentially a heat map of where people are moving. So if it's blue, you're seeing inbound moves. Tennessee, You've seen inbound moves. Uh, we see that overall. You can see that people are actually having a pretty big exodus from uh, West Coast, very unaffordable places, also in New England um, and, and up in the Northeast. So when we look at this overall on the, the chart on the right-hand side here, Tennessee is actually only behind the Carolinas, Texas, and Florida when we think about migration flow into your state. So talking to realtor groups in Knoxville, um, in Chattanooga, y'all are feeling a lot of this migration flow across the state. Uh, so continuing to see this and, and continuing to be really attractive places as we think about the Sun Belt, as we think about job growth, um, and we think about these migration flows here. To put a kind of finer point on this, one of the things that we are seeing, and I know this has been talked about quite a bit in the media, but we finally have data on it. And I think that's that's the exciting point for us. This is self-reported data. So that's the one caveat here. This is where a home buyer moved uh, to. And what we can see here is that rural areas, small towns, outer suburbs, those are places that had a lot of growth in the last year. And so I know that we are all talking about people moving out further distances from downtown city centers, but we really are seeing it. The big caveat is because it's self-reported data, if someone's moving from New York City and they're moving into Nashville, it's still a city. We all know that, that it's still a city, but they may be saying, oh, I'm moving into a suburban area or moving into a small town, which we know is not true. Um, when we think about the migration flow and just how long of distances that people are moving, I think this is quite unusual when we look at the activity in the last year as well. From 1989 to 2021, people moved just 10 to 15 miles. They really stayed pretty uh, in their local area. They stayed pretty good where they were. In the last year, they moved 50 miles as a median, meaning half of movers actually moved well beyond that. When we look at repeat buyers in the market, we actually see that the median distance moved is actually 90 miles, so a very long distance away. One of the big things that I would say is that as a realtor working with these clients, they may not know that area at all. They're putting a lot of trust and reliance in you because they don't know that area. You're the local expert and you have to convey that information to them about the neighborhood, about the home, 
all of that information is now squarely on your shoulders, where in the past, if we look at this, it really had not been as much because that buyer was just moving 10 miles down the block. They really did kind of know that local area in a way that they are not likely to at this point right now, especially as people move these long distances. When we look at this too, I think one of the interesting phenomenons that has been happening here is that people are actually still purchasing homes uh, based on virtual tours, virtual showings, virtual open houses only. They're not physically actually seeing that home before they place that offer on it. Um, and that home is under contract. They're doing this with a realtor. So it's hand in hand with you. They are doing this with a realtor, but this is an unusual thing that has happened during the pandemic. And it seems to be pretty much here to stay. Uh, this last month's data is the lowest that we have recorded. It's a short time span here. We only started recording this data uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So April of 2020. And the reason why is because we were seeing a lot of this activity happen. Now, it had been as high as double digits, up to 12% of all home buyers actually purchasing this home site unseen. Now at 4%, I'll be very curious to see where this goes, especially as we move into the spring market, uh, when we know that we still have tight inventory. I think there's a couple of factors at play. One is distance, and that's why I threw it into this section. But another is that there is tight inventory. So a buyer may not be able to physically get to that home before that home is under contract. And so they're really relying on that realtor to show them that home in a way that they had not in the past. And that really does change your job and that role and that trust that that buyer is putting in you. I want to talk about millennials. I know that we are all kind of tired of hearing about them, um, but I want to jump in. When we look at millennials, we know that they are the biggest buying segment out there. They're more than 40% of all home buyers today. So it makes them quite important when we talk about them. And they really do have this pretty big span. They span from young 20s all the way up to 42 years old. So it is a massive generation and a massive age span. And we know that a 42 year old is going to have very different housing um, situations than we think of for a 20 year old. Uh, so when we look at this data, we just have to keep that in mind as well. What we're looking at here in this chart is the entire U.S. population. And you can see smack dab in the middle of the chart is this millennial generation in the sea of blue. And what becomes visually very clear is that it is the biggest generation. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There's more millennials than anyone else on this chart and in the country. Uh, when we look at this data, what we can see here is that it is bigger than the Gen X generation in purple, but it's also bigger than the boomer generation. A couple of other takeaways from this chart here as well. Uh, when we look at the baby boomers in yellow, we can see that in the next three years, all boomers are going to be over the age of 60. Quite important when we think about retirement um, and future life and where they're going to move as well. What also becomes really important in this chart here is in this sea of blue is this red bar. That's the median age of a first time home buyer at 36 years old. So when we think about the lack of housing inventory that we have right now and the implications for the, this wave of millennials who's entering into peak household formation, they're right there. They're, they're 27 to about 32 years old, so that, that bump there in that chart. Those young adults are looking for a place to live. Whether it's looking for a place to rent or it's looking for home ownership, they're right there and they're trying to live independently. And so when you think about that lack of inventory, it really is impacting these young adults. The purple, the purple are the Gen Xers, and you can see that they really are overwhelmed by these two other big generations here. I'm not going to talk a lot about Gen Xers. It is a smaller generation, but I'll give you a few data points before we move too much further here, just so we don't get lost here uh, as I talk about millennials and boomers more. Gen Xers, while they are uh, in their peak earning years, they also have a lot of pressure. Uh, they may have older adult relatives who are living with them, uh, children who have boomeranged back who are well over the age of 18 now living with them, kids under the age of 18. All of these adults uh, and children perhaps living in the same house in this multi-generational property. Gen Xers are also an interesting generation because they were the most likely generation to have purchased their first home at the peak of the last housing boom. Uh, 
And they unfortunately were the most likely generation to have lost their home at that time period as well. They're back into the home buying market, but they are taking a longer period of time to look for that perfect home. So if they're working with you as a realtor, they may be looking at a lot of homes and really thinking about it, wanting to spend that time. And unfortunately, they, they don't have a lot of time right now before homes are under contract, but they may want to process that just in case they are in that home for a longer period than expected. When we look at first-time home buyers, unfortunately, what we can see, let me take a sip here. When we look at first-time home buyers, unfortunately, what we can see here is that 26% of the market is now a first-time home buyer. And that is well under the historic norm. The historic norm is actually 40%. So really seeing uh, a lot of struggles that first-time home buyers have had. And we've talked about those already. Lack of inventory and affordability, certainly. But the factor is outside of the housing market as well. Whether that's rising rents or student loan debt, the ability to save for a down payment essentially goes to the back burner for this potential first-time home buyer. As a result, their age has risen dramatically to 36 years old now. It had been that the age of a first-time home buyer was really between the ages of 28 and 32 years old. And had been for 40 years. So really seeing this dramatic jump speaks to the difficulty of these first-time home buyers entering into the market. We can also see another dramatic rise here, and that's the peach line. And what I think is pretty fascinating is to see the age of repeat buyers is now 59 years old. So we're really talking about someone who essentially is later in life. They're saying, I'm going to purchase this primary residence home as I perhaps am either in retirement or entering retirement, because this is a medium. So half of those are, are older than that. Um, and we see these buyers who are purchasing this primary residence home at a time where historically we wouldn't have seen this, we would have seen that people were the aging in place or they were thinking about perhaps moving in with family or moving into a nursing home or an aging center. They weren't thinking about purchasing a primary residence. And so seeing this big shift, I think, becomes very unusual as we look at this in the housing market because the traditional age or what we had seen the median age rather in 1981 was 36 years old for a repeat buyer. So same age as a first time buyer right now. When you think about the implications there, it's pretty interesting because one, for the first time home buyer, that could mean personally a lot of lost housing equity. It also may mean a move that's off the table. They may not make us move uh, into from their starter home into their next home because they don't have to, because they are purchasing this home closer to 40 than perhaps 30. So that's an interesting scenario as well. What's also interesting is that as we see this 59-year-old and this 36-year-old in the housing market, that 36-year-old has likely struggled quite a bit to enter into home ownership. That 59-year-old actually is probably doing pretty well, probably have a lot of housing equity. They're able to really purchase the home that they want to live and thrive in and really have this uh, these bonus years of their life in a way that we have not seen for past generations. So this really is an unusual setting that is happening at the same time in the housing market. One of the things that happened during the pandemic is that a lot of young adults moved home. We saw that uh, actually a peak of nearly 18% of young adults moved home between the ages of 25 and 34. We've seen it decline. It's now uh, about 15.6%. And we knock a lot of these young adults for doing this, but I have to say, I think it was pretty smart. When we look at this and we look at the ability of these young adults to do this, hybrid work, remote work, all certainly played a big factor here. Remote school, uh, all of those are factors for these young adults to be able to move home. But it essentially moved that rental agreement off the table because they really were just living at home. And as we see this, it improved their financial situation, at least for some. We see 27% of first-time home buyers move directly from their family members' home into homeownership. So the way they save for a down payment is to skip rent. And this is the largest share we've ever seen. If we look at this back in 1989, it was 15% of first-time home buyers making this move from their family member's home. And just last year, it was 21%. So really seeing a very sizable share. 
I will say, uh, not to be a broken record, but I think this is one more instance where it makes your life a little harder uh, because we are seeing first-time home buyers who may have mom and dad's expectations of what that home should be, what that first home should look like, uh, should it be down the street for mom and dad, all of those expectations really rolled up there. The other thing that could be happening, of course, is that mom and dad are really in tow as they come to see that house and have those expectations as well. And they're working with you as well as that actual first time home buyer. We do have survey data on this, and it, it does suggest that this is happening and happening at an increased rate than what we had seen in the past uh, historically. The other thing that we do know about today's first time home buyers is 22% of them actually have down payment assistance directly from mom and dad. So just a, a generational transfer of wealth that is happening here to allow this first time home buyer into their first property. And again, this is uh, something that has not always historically been the same. Uh, we actually have seen it higher in past years, as high as nearly a third. Uh, but I do think that it's it's probably edged down a little bit in the last year, as that first time home buyer is now a median age of thirty six. Might be quite uncomfortable to actually move home and also get a generational transfer of wealth. So uh, perhaps not seeing all of that uh, happening for that thirty six year old. I just want to throw out a few demographic changes that we're seeing here um, in the data. And I think this is pretty interesting when we look at this. One of them is the household composition of home buyers. If we look back to 1985, we see the vast majority of first time home buyers were actually married. So having dual incomes, uh, having that reliance, perhaps having more buying power because they do have those dual incomes. Today is just 50%. So really seeing a, a pretty big shift here in who those home buyers are. And this actually mirrors really the marriage rates in this country. We really have seen those decline. We see a lot of single households in the U.S. today. Uh, and unfortunately, sing for a single uh, individual in the home buying market, that's going to mean less buying power. That's just one income to rely on. And as we have this affordability crisis, it's going to mean uh, perhaps a smaller home, a different neighborhood, uh, really shifting that uh, what they can actually purchase from that, that property. When we do look at this, though, I, I think it's pretty fascinating to see that single women account for 19% of the market in 2022, uh, single men 10% of the market. So pretty flat there uh, when we look at single men historically, but single women really a pretty sizable share. What's interesting here is when we pull out this data, what we can see is that single women are traditionally purchasing on a lower household income than single men. They have to save for a longer period of time, and they're willing to make all of these financial sacrifices for homeownership. So really pulling out and saying, nope, this is my top financial priority. I am wanting to do this. This is something I, I want for my future, my long-term future. We are seeing a rise in unmarried couples in the home buying market as well. Uh, they traditionally are younger. Uh, they traditionally do have a lower household income and they actually had, do have different home preferences as well. And so I pulled out both of these in recent blog posts. So if you're interested in diving more into this, uh, we've got a lot of backup research on this. Uh, one of the, the rises here too, that I think is interesting is roommates. Uh, we are seeing this overall nationwide in the housing market. I'm not sure if you're seeing it in your local area. It's just 5% of buyers, uh, but it's people who are saying, I want to pull my income. I want to do this and they are moving forward together. So I uh, perhaps have rented together for a long period of time, I'm not sure, and, and are moving forward to purchase this home together. One of the other big demographic changes that we are seeing is that there is a drop in home buyers who have children in their home. Now, one of the big reasons why is we have more repeat buyers in the market, they're accounting for a bigger share, and they're older. So they may have kids, but those kids are out of the house. It's very possible. Uh, but we are seeing this decline, and it's a pretty continual decline. Um, we also have a, a lot of child-free families out there. And so people who are saying, I, I don't want children or can't have them, regardless of the reason, we are seeing this decline as well. So back in 1985, 58% of home buyers did have children, and today it's just 31%. And so why am I talking about this? Well, it does change what that home buyer perhaps can afford. If we think, well, let's take daycare out of that equation, it suddenly means perhaps a bigger home, a nicer home, but it also means uh, perhaps a different location. So perhaps that A plus school district is less of a priority for that empty nester who doesn't have a child in their home anymore. 
We also know this could change the number of moves. So if you have a growing family, perhaps you need to move to accommodate that new child, have room for them. And if you're an empty nester, again, perhaps you can move as well out of that perfect A plus school district into somewhere else. One of the other ones, and I know this is a much lighter note, um, is for babies. I, I know that there was a lot of pandemic adoptions out there of animals. Uh, truly, shelters were cleared out and did not actually have animals to adopt for a time period as well. So as we saw those pandemic adoptions of fur babies happen, uh, suddenly people have realized they need room to accommodate that new dog who is now large and not a puppy. Um, we're also seeing people saying, I want to be close to a dog park. I need to be close to walking trails. And now we're seeing 19% of buyers in the last year actually factored in their pets into their home buying decision. Uh, for single women, for unmarried couples, for younger buyers, all of those uh, are actually seeing it's, it's closer to a quarter of home buyers who are actually factoring in their pets. So uh, really a pretty sizable amount of these home buyers. Uh, we did a survey of realtors and y'all told us too that you've worked, 18% of you have worked with a client who's solely moving to find a new home for their pet. So really are seeing a lot of this activity right now. Uh, senior buyers, uh, this is a fascinating trend. I, I think that people are really living their best lives later in life. They are healthier and they uh, have a lot of stamina and they are healthy and uh, let's jump into the data. When we look at this, what we can see is that they are moving very long distances away from their past residents. They're following their grandbaby. They're not necessarily downsizing. A lot of the myths that we have about young adults, we have about seniors too. We often think of them not necessarily embracing these smart home features or green features, but they are. Um, they have the money to do so. And when we look at this, we can see that they actually are saying, I want a home that has these bells and whistles. Some of this could be that they have the intention of aging in place and to have these bells and whistles certainly makes life a little easier. If you can tell uh, Google or Alexa to turn on the lights uh, or turn down the lights, that certainly is one less thing to do uh, and, and makes life easy. When we see those two, we know that people are living in uh, more single adults out there today. And so they're embracing this. And so there's a lot of single women who are purchasing homes, but we also see perhaps a Grace and Frankie trend or a Golden Girls trend, however you want to cut it. We see a lot of single women who are actually pairing up and buying homes together as roommates, uh, perhaps for a, a companionship or affordability, uh, they're doing so. Um, when we look at the space that they want, they do want a newer space and they want some place that was built recently, perhaps because it makes life easier, also because they can afford to. If they can find a more affordable property, they certainly will take advantage of that and they certainly will pay all cash if they can. But sometimes those things are off the table, unfortunately, right now. One of the other things that I think is quite important when we talk about seniors is to think about multi-generational living. Uh, we see a lot of this activity right now in the marketplace. It's actually 14% of all buyers. It's not an all-time high, but it's it's quite near there. Uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic and in, in really spring of 2020, we saw the activity of multi-generational buying went up to 15%. So a lot of people saying, nope, I want to have my, my older adult relative in my house. Um, when we look at this activity now, we do actually know that elderly caregiving, but also spending time with elderly relatives is really fueling this trend. Uh, and perhaps when you think again about daycare and the cost of daycare, the ability of parents to find uh, quality childcare, uh, a lot of people are saying, well, the grandparents, uh, that is built in daycare. And so we're seeing perhaps caregiving going both directions in that. I touched on this when I talked about Gen Xers. This really is a Gen Xer trend that we are seeing here um, with Gen Xers. We had seen this traditionally among younger boomers, but really we do see this uh, among Gen Xers at this point. We are actually starting to see this among older millennials as well. So perhaps people pooling their incomes and saying, let's buy a bigger house, a nicer house. And that older relative is actually still in the workforce. And so I, there's a lot of different scenarios out there, but regardless of the intent, we are seeing this happen. 
So one of the big changes that we have seen in the data is tenure at home and how long people are holding on to it. It's now all the way up to 10 years. Um, this isn't really the big change that we are seeing because we've seen it there for actually a number of years, really coming out of the Great Recession. Um, and we have seen that people are really staying put. They have lower interest rates. And, and so there's really no intention of moving. Uh, traditionally, we had seen this back in the 80s and 90s that people moved every six to seven years. If we look at this now though, and we look at the expected tenure in home, this is where the really interesting change has happened in the last year. When buyers went to purchase their home last year, they planned on living there for a very long period of time. For first time home buyers, they plan on holding onto that property for 18 years. I'll just let that sink in because 18 years is a very long time for that 36 year old. So really thinking about skipping that starter home. If we look at this historically back in 2007, they had planned on holding on to that first home for just seven years. And they actually held on to it for just five. So really thinking about a very short period of time. For repeat buyers, it's flat at 15 years, but that's still also a very long period of time. If we think about this, a couple of things here. One, we know that buyers did lock in that low interest rate last year, so they are staying put. We also know they move further out. They move close to friends and family as a neighborhood priority. And so perhaps they were able to buy that single family home essentially in a small town or a burb and said, well, I'm just going to stay put. We also know that that intention of quick equity really has gone out the window with a great recession. People don't think of their home that way, even though they have earned a lot of equity in the last two years, especially, they don't necessarily think of their home that way. And so I think we have seen a mind, uh, a shift here in the psychology of those home buyers. One of the big things that I would say, though, is that I think this data is a little shocking when you think about the home buying market and the frequency of moves. But the big thing that does happen is that something in these, these buyers' lives may change. So while they say 18 years or even 15 years, if they have a new baby, if they have a marriage or a divorce or a new job, they're going to have to move. And so I think keeping in context that people do move because something in their life changes is always true. And so I think regardless of the reason that could actually happen, um, even if their intention is to hold on to that property for a very long period of time. So I've talked about a lot of different changes that have happened in the last couple of years and uh, expectations for moving forward. I will say one of the very consistent things that we are seeing is the agent role. 86% of buyers are using an agent in their home search process. Uh, they, they want an agent by their side, not only to find that perfect home, but help with negotiation, uh, help understanding all of the faults and features in that property, the local area, really being that navigator through this home search process and, and finding them that perfect property that they can live in for a very long period of time. When we look at sellers, we do see that 87%, 9 in are using a seller's agent. And we ask a follow-up question here about the type of agent that's being used. <clears throat> full service agent, someone who's providing all of the services, such as how do I stage my home, virtual tours, a beautiful listing, attracting that qualified buyer, pricing the home competitively, and then getting that home under contract all within a specific time frame, and then past the closing table, who do I contact for services as well, such as the moving truck and the painters and so on. And that's where that full service agent is become very important and very crucial to those sellers. I think we are really in a time of a lot of anxiety, especially as someone leaves uh, their primary residence and they're saying, okay, I'm going on to move to this next property. People are saying, I really do want that full service agent to be able to navigate that with me and really help me out through that process. So I want to give just one final note here. I promised you nine. I got one more slide left. Before I jump in, um, I will preface all of this data with, we have a lot of data on this topic. Uh, I could probably give another 40 minute presentation just on this. Um, and we are releasing a brand new report next week as well uh, that focuses on this topic. And so uh, without further ado, uh, what I am going to talk about here is the uh, black and white gap in homeownership and in home buying activity. When we look at this, we know that the gap right now is as wide as when the Fair Housing Act started, when it was actually legal to discriminate based on race and housing. And we know that there's a lot of reasons why when we look at this data. 
Unfortunately, in the last year, the gap has actually gotten worse and we can actually see a growth in white home buyers and actually a decline in black home buyers and in Asian home buyers. Um, and when we look at this data, I think it's really important to take note of a few of the, the differences here between black home buyers and the struggles that they're facing entering into the home buying market in comparison to white home buyers. Uh, one of them is that we know that black home buyers, unfortunately, have uh, a smaller household income. They are also less likely to actually have uh, family assistance and that generational transfer of wealth that can be quite helpful for first time home buyers uh, when we look at this. Uh, data and see the success that first-time home buyers have if they have generational transfers of wealth. Unfortunately, what is happening for Black home buyers consistently in the data is that they're often tapping their 401k or their down payment uh, or for their down payment as opposed to having that, that transfer of wealth or being able to just rely on savings. We also know looking at the data that we have and what we will be releasing next week as well is that uh, student loan debt is much higher for minority home buyers than it is for white home buyers. It, larger share have it, and they have a larger amount. And so that's unfortunately going to trail them for a longer period of life. And we are seeing that they're having a harder time paying that down with lower uh, income as well and household earnings. So um, as I jump into this data and show you this slide, again, prefacing this with, we'll have a brand new report out next week. And those are just some of the highlights uh, that we have consistently found over the last three to four years of doing this report and many other reports on this topic, uh, but seeing a rise in white home buyers in the last year and a decline in black home buyers. So um, what I would say, and I, I think the next question to this always is, what can we do? And what I would say is we need to all work on this, be acknowledging that this is a problem, put out good information talk about low down payment programs such as FHA and VA loans. Um, we know that half of Black home buyers are first-time home buyers. So what is the information that you would put out for first-time home buyers to educate them, to tell them what are their options out there? Um, the other thing that does happen consistently in what we have seen in the data, whether it's our data or Humda data, is that the denial rate for Black potential home buyers and Hispanic home buyers is higher. And it's significantly higher than white home buyers. So putting information out there with your list and your Rolodex of contacts of here's a big old list of mortgage brokers that we can help to get you into a loan um, and, and move this step forward. So that's all I have on that topic, but I am going to pass it back and stop sharing my screen and happy to take any questions that you have as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Jessica. That's really, really great information. I took a lot of notes and we don't have any uh, questions that have been sent yet, but uh, just so everybody out there in the this listening, if you do have questions for Jessica in uh, about the presentation or something related to the presentation, please send that over and we will try to get those questions asked. In the meantime, um, I am going to ask um, a question like, your very first slide talked about, um, you know, like not getting caught up in the headlines, right? And so our members are navigating a new market compared to what they were in a year ago. And for some of our members, many of our members, this is the first time they've ever seen a more normalized uh, market. So uh, very quickly, like, what would you say the messaging is right now? Um, obviously, it is, uh, we don't have as much con competition in the marketplace. So you do have uh, more options as far as um, looking at or finding a home that, that works for your family. But what are the other positive messaging messages that we can send to um, our consumers and to our realtors uh, about the current state of the market? Yeah, it's hard, right? Um, because we know that affordability is really hitting consumers right now. I would say, you know, trying to combat the misinformation that could be out there, the, the comparisons to 2008, 2009, with the no, we have tight inventory and no, we have tight lending standards. So that certainly makes the huge difference right now um, in those two markets. And the other thing that I would say too is that for first time home buyers, in the last two months, we've actually seen the share of first time home buyers tick up a little bit. I don't know if it's a full year. I don't know if it's just seasonal volatility in the data. 
Um, traditionally we do see winter months are better for first time home buyers. Um, but I think getting that information out there, there is less competition. So now you actually might have a chance to get your offer accepted, even at a higher interest rate. But if you can afford to get into the market now might be a better time to do so without going a hundred thousand more over asking price, which we saw quite frequently last year. I think for sellers or current homeowners, really encouraging them that if you don't have the right home for your family and you really think that you're going to make that work with a lower interest rate, you are probably sitting on a lot of housing equity and you probably can actually make that move to right size your home, to right neighborhood your home and really make that decision right now um, rather than just squeezing in. And if not, a touch point for them, give them a remodeler or two because they probably need to use their home in a different way, at least mm -hmm. moving forward. And so having that touch point because they're going to refer you. Um, even if they're not personally using you, they will refer you on. So having that list of remodelers for those home sellers, potential home sellers in the future could be really helpful. Great. Well, you just touched on one of our next questions is, do you have any data on like what percentage of the seller market or sellers are choosing to renovate rather than relocate? I don't. Um, what I will say is I think it's higher um, than perhaps uh, we would have seen in the past because mobility is going to be down with higher interest rates. It, it always traditionally declines with as interest rates uh, increase. And so I don't have any hard data on that, but I think some people are just going to choose to renovate. Uh, because of that, we will be releasing a new remodeling impact outdoors features. Uh, we released an indoor features. So looking at kitchens and baths and remodeling that way uh, last year, but we'll do an outdoor features this spring as well. Wonderful. And then we also have a question. Uh, people have some interest about the report that you just talked about in your ninth, um, ninth oh. topic. Uh, what day is that coming out and where can that be found? Is that going to be at nar.realtor? Um, and, and when can we look for that? Yes, uh, it's going to be released on March 1st. It's called a snapshot of race and home buying in America. Um, and it'll be on nar.realtor. But if you follow on social media, any of the NAR research accounts, uh, you can find it there too. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Uh, when you had the data on the number of offers that are being received, I believe last year it was uh, five and now we're at two and a half. Where did, how did you gather that data? Yeah, actually, that's a survey of you all. So thank you proactively uh, for taking the survey. Um, if you do not take any of our research surveys, please consider doing them because you can see how the data is used. Um, it's called our Realtors Confidence Index. We've actually been running that survey since 2008 on a monthly basis, and we are taking direct uh, feedback from realtors about the housing market, what's going on in their local market, uh, how many offers they're receiving, and as well as a whole other host of uh, things such as the foreclosures, uh, such as the Olcast offers, who are your clients, how many are first-time buyers. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned the cash buyers at 29% of across the country, total cash buyers. Um, do you have information on the average size or me, the, the size of the down payment for the other 71% that um, is in the marketplace? Um, yes and no. So that is among the entire universe of buyers. So that includes both investors and primary residence buyers. For the typical first-time primary residence buyer out there, they typically put down 6 to 7% um, as a down payment. For the typical uh, repeat buyer in the market, they're typically putting down, I think, 17%. Um, so we are seeing, I think it's 17%. It's less than 20. Uh, it's into the teens for the typical down payment. Those are primary residence buyers, though. Thank you. Um, our next question goes back to topic number nine. Is there data um, on the reasons why loan denials are um, are higher in um, our Black population than, than otherwise? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we do actually collect that data. So the one thing I will say is that sometimes lenders don't tell you. Um, and I, this is self-reported data of successful home buyers. So another caveat there. We don't have them among those who are denied and they just walked away from the process. Uh, and that's that's really unfortunate. I don't have that touch point in the data or a way to really get to them. But among successful home buyers, uh, we do have that. And so uh, frequently cited is debt to income ratio, uh, low credit score, not enough money in reserves. Um, we don't have necessarily though the things that are unset or the uncallbacks or things that do happen in that process as well. Sure, sure. Um, 
with the market um, shifting it, it, with higher interest rates, builders are now offering more incentives um, for buyers. Are you seeing or expecting to see a higher number of buyers going with new construction um, based on those factors? Um, and do you have any data around that? Um, we do have, so we have data from looking backwards. Um, what I would say is, I don't think so. Uh, builder activity is down. <laughs> They've retracted, so they might be offering incentives if they're still out there. Um, but what we have seen, unfortunately, is that a lot of builders have said, I can't make ends meet. I can't have the profit for this property, or I can't find the labor or the supplies. And so we have seen that that activity has been down for a solid 10 years, more than solid 10 Sure. And those issues are really trailing. And as interest rates go up, their activity has actually contracted in the marketplace as well. Thank you. Um, one of the things in your presentation that I found the most interesting was the 5% of roommate buyers um, that would be like, and, and what generation they're coming from. So um, that it might be retirement age buyers. Um, and then um, also the increase in unmarried couples uh, purchasing property together. Um, is there, do we expect to expect that trend to increase? How long have we been tracking that? So you see a 5% of it. Have we been tracking that for a while or is that yeah. a new, <laughs> new trend that we're seeing? So we've actually been tracking in that since 1981. So I say a, little, a while, um, 41 years of data on that. This is the highest we've seen either one of those figures. I think it's going to go up. I mean, uh, that's my guess, at least. We don't forecast that. Thank goodness. Um, what I would say is that it's probably going to go up. One, housing affordability is really difficult. Uh, two, there's a lot of single adults out there. We've seen the, the rate of marriage go down. And so a lot of people are cohabitating in different ways, whether that's multi-generational families, whether that's single adults cohabitating as roommates or unmarried couples, um, it's happening. And so people are going to buy property that way as well. And it helps with affordability and of course, companionship as well. So I, I think that it's likely going to increase or at least stay stable where it is. Great. Um, do you have any information on the average um, difference between list price to sale price, say over the last six months, since we've saw, seen the rise in the interest rates? Um, I don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, what I would say is I'm hoping that the National Association of Realtors actually does have that data um, because the local source is always better for that. So I'm hoping that I can push folks to your website. <laughs> Yes, and um, we can always get that information out to you if you reach out to our comms team um, and they can look that, that up for you. Um, I don't see any further questions, Dr. Louts. Um, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining us. Really, really great information. Is there anything that you would like to add before we go? Um, thank you just so much for having me and for all the realtors out there, your job has gotten harder. Hang in there. It, it's going to get better. Uh, everything does. Right. So I, I'm really hoping that, uh, this year it does start to get the upswing back up. Wonderful. Well, we, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and, um, thank everybody who, uh, took the, the hour to come and listen, and hopefully you learned something that you can take into your business and share with your clients. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in May at Nationomics in person. And uh, thank you so much. Have a great day.